can always tell when I need an extra minute to get going. <laughs> I put on uh, Psalm 51. I love that song from Michael, but uh, it's a, one of the longer songs he did. And if I need an extra minute, you get it in the beginning. So uh, welcome, everybody. This is Bill Donahue with Discerning Truth. And we're going to continue with the Gospel of John today. Glad to see you here. And uh, before we get started, I always uh, take care of business. Let me uh, do that now. Let me go. Here we are. So for any mail, you want to send it to the Lahui address on, on the top. Um, and then try to include the Suite 1300 number 164 on the thing. Uh, some of your programs may not want you to put that whole address, but... This is actually a UPS store. Suite 1300 is a UPS store, and 164 is my box. So it's kind of important to put the whole address on there. And, uh, you know, if your uh, program tells you it's wrong, just override it and use the one I'm giving you. Emails go to bill at uh, discerningtruths.com. And then uh, anything for the Profit Club is going to go to the Profit Club Clowns at gmail.com. And Michael and I have started working on our next Profit Club. I hope to get it out pretty quickly. And we'll do that. I'm kind of I'm excited to be doing Profit Clubs again. And uh, I haven't made any more progress on Rumble getting uh, my stuff up there. But uh, hopefully next week I'll start that and loading them again. But always on my shows, I create PDFs of what we do. Anything on the screen, any slides, and I put it in the Discerning Truth group on PDF. That's for your download, free, your own study, do with it what you will. And then, uh, we're good, let me get the next slide. My schedule, I broadcast Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at noon Pacific time. Uh, Monday and Wednesday, I'm going to be in the book of Gospel of John until we finish. And since this is my uh, fourth stream in uh, in the Gospel of John, we did an introduction, and this is my third stream trying to get out of chapter one. Uh, it's going to take a minute to get through the Gospel of John. And those of you that spent a year with me in Isaiah know I take my time and deal with a book thoroughly. Uh, on Fridays, I try to do something different, things that you're not normally going to be... Uh, Taught in church, it's usually a one-offer subject. You know, I'll go in and, and do one day. I'm going to start a series called Popular Myths on Friday and start dealing with a bunch of myths that I know that are on the Internet and, and came out in books and that uh, Christians still don't know how to refute. And I'm going to uh, just start nailing them over the next few weeks. And then on Tuesdays, I hope you're tuning in to listen in to my conversation with Neil. Uh, she usually comes on 10.20, 10.25-ish Chicago time, uh, Central time. And then um, I join her, you know, 15, 30 minutes into her um, program. And, and we often talk for an hour or so. Um, so it, it's just fun. I really enjoy it. And it's like a, a phone conversation between you and I that you all get to listen in on. And then uh, I start out my day with Michael Beatty, Miguel California. Um, and today is Wednesday, so he will be coming on. It is Wednesday, right? Yeah, <laughs> I'm hoping I got the right day. But yeah, um, he'll be coming on when I go off and doing um, Bend the Knee program today. Uh, but he comes on at 5.30 a.m. Pacific time, Monday to Friday. Uh, that's 3.30 here, so you won't see me in a chat very often. Uh, but occasionally I'm up that early. And then on Sunday morning, his wife Linda joins him and they're going through Psalms. He's doing Nehemiah right now. And uh, wow, was he on fire this morning. So if you missed it, go back and, and listen. So with that, we're going to jump right into the Gospel of John. Jesus is going to start picking his disciples. And, uh, you know, when you're a kid in Sunday school, they ask you to name the 12 disciples, but they never bother telling you that they got different names <laughs> and that they have a thing. And one of the problems with the uh, Bible that I find is all the different names. One, they're unfamiliar names, a lot of them. I mean, names like John and James are easy, but you have a lot of names that we don't usually deal with. And then you'll have four people called Mary. There's three or four James and Johns, and, you know, it gets confusing. And then you have people that are given nicknames or different names by other people. And just among the 12 apostles, 
The apostle we call Peter's name is Simon. Okay, Jesus nicknamed him Peter. Okay, and uh, Peter Petros in Greek is what he called him. And then Andrew is the brother of Simon or Peter. Now, Andrew luckily doesn't have a nickname or a second name. Then you have one of the Jameses is called James, the son of Zebedee. Now, Jesus gives James and his brother John, the writer of this gospel, the nicknames of the sons of thunder. John gives himself a nickname as the disciple who Jesus loved. No, no egotism there in, in John. But he says he had 12 disciples, but he loved one of them, and it was me. Okay, it's it. I love John in that. Now, Philip was nice, easy to remember name, and uh, no nicknames, no second names. And then we're going to run into Nathaniel today, but uh, he's called Bartholomew in some of the Gospels. Same person. And then you have Thomas, Doubting Thomas, and his name is Didymus. Uh, and I'm not sure why he has two names. And then you have Matthew, who's the tax collector. Uh, Matthew sticks with one name. And... Uh, James, the son of Alphaeus. So you had James, the son of Zebedee up there at number three. And now we have the James, the son of Alphaeus. And then you have a guy called Thaddeus or Lebe, Le, Lebius in some translations. He's also called Judas, <laughs> Judas the Zealot. And in some translations, Judas, the son of James. Okay. And then uh, now some of your translations will say the brother of James. And that's not correct. The word is son. So this is Judas, the son of James. And what we believe is that this is Judas, the son of James, the son of Alphaeus, which would make him his grandson. It could be one of the James, but it gets unclear. But you got a guy here with at least three names. And then you have Simon, another Simon, distinguished from Simon called Peter. This Simon is sometimes called the Zealot or the Canaanite, or Canaanin, depends on your translations. And so this is another Simon. So you got two Simons, one Simon's called Peter, you got two James, and then you have, because Thaddeus is also called Judas, you have two Judases here, right? Judas, uh, the son of Simon Iscariot, or who we call Judas Iscariot. So there's just a little of the names you're gonna run through, because Jesus is gonna start picking his disciples today and these names are going to come up. So I left off in verse 34 last time. And we're in verse 35 to 37. It says, and the next day, um, sorry, I wasn't prepared. The next day again, John, the John Baptist was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked and walked by and said, behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him, John the Baptist, say this, and they followed Jesus. So John's ministry is paying off. And, and I detailed my last thing, uh, John must decrease in, while Jesus increased. So the end of John's ministry is coming. He came to uh, pave the way for Jesus. The paving's done, you know. The foundation is laid. Jesus is here. So his ministry is going to be over now. Herod's going to put an end to his ministry by taking his head, but uh, he's basically here and uh, trying to convince his disciples to follow Jesus. That's the point John, the apostle who wrote this gospel made, was he was taking the disciples of John and convincing them that John the Baptist would have wanted them to follow Jesus, right? And he gives John's testimony uh, to do that. Okay, now the Lamb of God reference that he gets here, it's going back to Genesis 22, 8. Um, and it's further developed in the Exodus story with the uh, Passover and, and the Lamb. And, and it then brought forth to point to the Messiah in Isaiah, in Isaiah 53, 1 to 12. And if you remember, this is what the Old Testament writers did. One and the New Testament writers as well. You will have somebody like Moses that introduces the subject. And then somebody else like maybe David will grab that subject and pull a quote, a paraphrase or an allusion out of 
its original context in Genesis or Exodus or Deuteronomy and use it in the Psalms and add detail or make a new theological point. This is what Isaiah does. He takes the, the lamb from both Genesis 22 and Exodus 12 and he pulls it forward and makes a new theological point that it's about Jesus. And then in the New Testament, the Apostle John specifically in, in John 1, 29 and 36 and 3, 16, and then it, all through Revelation, I give you a bunch of things. He really builds on that Jesus being the Lamb of God. But you also see Peter do it in 1 Peter 1, 18 to 21, and Paul does it in 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Luke does it in Acts 8, 32. So they all build upon this. So you have an idea that starts in one book, and then they, they pull it out and either add information to it or make a new theological point. That is how the Bible is written. And if you want to understand it at any kind of depth and not just the main and plain things of the Bible, you need to understand how to backtrack that and to look back for where did they, what's the original context? What did that phrase mean when it was first used? What are they trying to tell us by using that phrase now? In verses 38 to 42, it says, Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, no, these are the two disciples of John the Baptist started following Jesus. And he turns around and says, what are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw and where he was staying. And he stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour. It means they're starting an hour at 6 a.m. This is John's accounting time per Roman time. At 6 a.m. the day starts, not the day started the night before, okay? Like the Jews. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Okay, so this is Andrew, one of the apostles, and Simon, who's going to get named Peter later, it's his brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means the Christ. It actually means the anointed one, okay? He brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, meaning Peter, okay? Cephas in Hebrew, Petros in Greek, Peter in English. Same name, okay? But... When it says, what are you seeking? Those are the first words recorded by Jesus in John's gospel. And what a powerful question that is. And we're going to discover pretty soon as we go through John that the answer to the longings of humanity isn't an intellectual solution or philosophy. It, it, it's a person. It's a relationship with logos, with God and human flesh. You were created with a God-sized hole in your heart, and only he going to fill it. And that's what he's saying. What are you seeking? I'm seeking that relationship with God. God wants that relationship with you. This is, this is where this gospel starts, right getting down to the nitty-gritty. What do you want? And if you want the relationship with God that God wants with you, he's going to give it to you, right? I'm not going to force you into it. You don't want a relationship with him. He'll put you in a place where only he doesn't exist, right? Uh, I'm suggesting a relationship's a better option. Now, I put up these same verses again and highlighted a di different section because it says one of the two heard that John following, and he goes and gets uh, Peter. Now, you're going to have this idea that Peter's like first among the apostles, or in, especially from a Catholic background, that Peter's the uh, rock upon which the church was built and stuff. And I'll deal with that in a minute. But one of the problems with trying to elevate Peter to the first among equals is that he's not even the first apostle in his own family. He comes in after his brother Andrew converts to Christianity to follow, become a disciple of Jesus. Then Andrew gets Peter to join. That doesn't make him the first. So uh, this is a little bit of a uh, nonsensical idea that is out there. I understand why people want to do this, but it just doesn't, um, it's not supported in the tech. 
And then I highlighted the idea that Jesus gave him this nickname. And like I said, Cephas is Aramaic, or what we would call Hebrew, but it's Aramaic. Petros is in Greek, and Peter's English. It means stone. It's a small stone like a pebble that we get in your shoe, or a rock you might pick up to skip on a lake. It's a movable rock. Okay? But in Matthew 16, 16, where people will take this idea that upon Peter, the rock was, uh, the church was built, Jesus does a play on words. Okay? Peter declares, they're asking, Jesus says, who do they say I am? And some say he's a John the Baptist uh, reincarnated. Some say he's Elijah, whatever. Uh, and he says, who do you, whom do you say I am? And uh, Simon said, or Peter says, you are the living God, right? The son of the living God. And, he, and Jesus' response is upon this Petra, not Petros, I will build my church. The word Petra means a rock face, a cliff, a projecting rock, a solid uh, formation, fixed, immovable, enduring. It's a giant rock face on the on the side of a like mountain. So what he's he's talking to Petros, the pebble, the the uh, the movable stone, the the guy that's a little pebble in your shoe. And then using that play to say, no, the foundation upon which the church is going to be built is your declaration that I am the son of the living God. So again, you have people that uh, don't bother doing any study. They think he's talking to Peter and then, or they intentionally try to trick you into think that he said he built the church upon Peter. Now, verses 43 to 45 say, the next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethesda, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him whom the Moses and the law and all the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph, right? So if you only had John's gospel, you're going to think that this is the first time Jesus is meeting these people. He just walks up to him out of the blue and goes, follow me. But when you do a uh, look at the other gospels you're going to see that jesus has met these people numerous times uh, other than nathaniel nathaniel is going to be his intro or um in introduction to him but he went to he sought out philip he knows philip he went to find him and he finds philip and he tells him follow me and extends that formal in invitation to him right and uh they know Jesus as a rabbi or as a teacher. He's been teaching uh, his the way he's going to teach throughout his ministry. He's already been doing that. But he's talking about bringing them on as disciples, as like, not just random hearers. Like, you know, I talk to all of you on the stream every day. You're not my disciples. You're not there. You're not my students. We are here sharing the word together. If I took a young person in the church, typically a male, and you don't, it's not a good idea to, for a man to disciple a young girl. But if you take a young man and you're, you're kind of training them up and being a man and, and how to do that, you're going to disciple them. And so he's talking about come follow me and be like my students, right? The Baker Encyclopedia of the Bible gives this description of a disciple. Someone who follows another person or another way of life who submits himself to the discipline or teaching of that leader or way. And Jesus is going to teach them the way, which is what Christianity was originally called. It was called the way because it was not a new religion. It is the way Judaism was supposed to be practiced. Okay? And that's what it's called. It's, it's at Antioch where they're first called Christians. But he is. it's originally called the way. Uh, you will see people claim that there's no such thing as Christianity in the Bible. Again, nonsense. Uh, it says in Acts that they were called Christians in Antioch. And Antioch is a church that, according to tradition, was uh, founded by Peter. That's Antioch, Syria, not Antioch up in uh, Asia Minor. 
And then I highlighted in that same passage, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. Now, the stepfather of Jesus is named Joseph. But this is kind of a funny double entendre going on here, I think. I don't know if it's intended by John or not, but I just see it. Because some Jewish tradition points to four messianic figures called the four craftsmen. But the predominant view in Judaism was two messiahs. One is called Messiah ben Joseph, Messiah son of Joseph. And the other one is Messiah ben David, Messiah son of David. And Messiah ben Joseph is seen as the suffering servant who will rebuild the temple, while Messiah ben David is seen as the conquering king. Now, we as Christians know there aren't two messiahs. He's coming twice, once as a suffering servant and one as a conquering king. So, but it's funny that what we have here is their tradition about the Messiah, who is the son of Joseph, is that he will rebuild the temple. And what does Jesus do? He tells them, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days, right? In three days, I will raise it up. And the Jews said, it's taken 46 years to build this temple and you'll raise it in three days. And But look what I highlighted in blue. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. So even in the Jewish traditions, you have a lot of times some truth that always points to Jesus, right? I did that when I did the Passover meal because a lot of the details in the Passover Seder are not in Scripture. They were traditions added by Jews. And it's shocking how many of those uh, traditions point to Jesus. Not just the part that's in the Bible, but the traditions that they added, right? You know, point at Jesus. Now, verse 46 says, Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come and see. Come and look. Okay? Now, I highlighted, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And I scoured numerous commentaries looking for why Nathanael had such a bias in thinking, like, uh, you know, was Nazareth like Skid Row? You know, what was the thing? And None of the explanations I found uh, were satisfactory to me. And, and I looked at the pulpit commentary, um, and it, the first two points that they made, I thought refuted most of the theories that i seen out there. And it says, The pre prejudice against Nazareth as being a Galilean town cannot have weighed with Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, right? We know Nathaniel's from Cana, so why would he as a Galilean look down on another Galilean city? That doesn't make any sense. Even though he may have shared the ignorant opinion that out of Galilee arises no prophet, which is repeated in, we're going to hear that in John 7, 52. He might have known that uh, Jonah, Hosea, Nahum, and probably Elijah, Elijah, and Amos, Amos were all Galileans. Those are all Old Testament prophets. So this idea that um, not everything in Scripture is prescriptive, meaning not everything is going to tell you what to do. Like when we get to John 7.52, it's telling you what people believed, not necessarily when it says, out of Galilee arises no prophet. Some people will say, well, there's a Bible contradiction here because, of course, we had prophets come out of uh, Galilee. In the second theory, they said that Nazareth was a secluded and contemptible village, seems disproved by interesting papers, and he, uh, they list Dr. Sal uh, Merrill and uh, Galilee in the time of our Lord, and, uh, and they give you the reference. So in there, he, he refutes the two theories that seem to have the most um, prominent followings. I did find on the Got Questions website, and I told you before, it's a mixed bag. Both both this website, and I use it a lot, this website and the one by Matt Slick, I can't think of the name of his right off the top of my head, are both some of the best information I find on the internet and some of the worst on, on the same sites. So you just got to um, use what you can. But his speculation is as good as anything else I've seen. He says the low view of Nazareth is important to understand Matthew's claim that Jesus was fulfilled, said 
uh, through the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene because there's no evidence. That's from Matthew 2, 23. Now, some people try to say he took a Nazarite vow. There's no evidence of that. He's from Nazareth. That's why he's going to be called a Nazarene. Nothing in the Old Testament explicitly says that Jesus would be from Nazareth. So what is Matthew talking about? Most likely, Matthew is referring to those prophecies regarding Christ that revealed how others will despise him and treat him poorly, like Psalm 22, 6 and 7, and Isaiah 52, 3. Now, that is clear from the Old Testament, that he's going to be despised and hated. And if the Nazarites, people from Nazareth, were looked down upon, then Matthew's comment about he'll be called a Nazarene and the comments from Nathaniel here makes sense. Now, Psalm 22, 6 describes Christ as being scorned by everyone, despised by the people, and they hurled insults and shaken their head. Isaiah 53 describes Christ as despised and rejected by mankind. It is possible that these passages are the prophecies to which Matthew alludes in the statement he would be called a Nazarene. Okay. Nathaniel's mocking question can anything good come from Nazareth, foreshadows the fact that Jesus would be mocked more earnestly than others. And uh, Nathaniel asked the question because the Christ was seen to be the one who would deliver Israel from oppression. The long-awaited Messiah was to be held in highest esteem. So why would he come from a place like Nazareth? Or Bethlehem, for that matter. Why shouldn't he come from Jerusalem, right? That's what would be expected. So you can see this contempt. It's already built in in the initial question from uh, Nathaniel. And I think God questions speculation. And I try to label speculation for what it is. When people don't have serious facts, he's making his best guess. And I thought it was reasonable. Okay. Verses 47 to 51 say, Jesus saw Nathaniel coming towards him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? And Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now this is Jesus in his, in his omnipresence, in, in his om, in omniscience. He was able to do that. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you're the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Okay? Sounds like an Old Testament quote, doesn't it? Watch this. The one thing that surprised me is all it took for Nathaniel to believe that he was the Son of God and the King of Israel was for Jesus to tell him he saw him under the fig tree. That's not a Thomas. <laughs> Okay, I need more evidence to that. He was easy. He, he flipped pretty easily. But then you, you, you have in the, in the first 18 verses of this Ch John chapter 1, we had that very high Christology from uh, the Apostle John in presenting Jesus as the eternal God in human flesh. That deep theology has picked up again here with Nathaniel identifying him as the son of God and king of Israel. Both titles are messianic. Then Jesus uses the title of son of man for himself. And that's another messianic title taken from Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, and other places in Daniel. But it's a, a, a presentation of, of uh, the Messiah. Now, this vision of angels ascending and descending, when he says you're going to see angels descending and ascending and descending on the Son of Man, is actually a vision from Genesis 28, 12, where Jacob sees the ladder going to heaven, and the angels are ascending and descending. And you go, well, there's a ladder there, and there's the Son of Man here. This is what Jesus has done. He has replaced the ladder with himself. Because he is that ladder between heaven and earth, or that bridge, so to speak. The angels and, and, uh, can ascend and, and descend through him. Mankind can ascend into heaven because of Jesus. 
So he takes a well-known passage about angels ascending and descending and adds a new theological point, exactly like we have seen all through Isaiah, all through Revelation. Now we're seeing it in the Gospel of John. This is how the Bible is written. And this is, other than learning context, 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 this may be the second most important point you ever learned from me, is that that's, you have to find what they're quoting in the Old Testament to understand what they're talking about, okay? <clears throat> so many novice Bible readers and critics see Jesus or the Gospel writer, specifically Mark, referring to Jesus as the Son of Man and think it's an argument against his deity. But what the, does the source text in Daniel tell us? about the Son of Man. And here's the source text from Daniel 7. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there was one came like the Son of Man. And he came to the Ancient of Days. Ancient of Days is God, Yahweh. And was presented before him. And to him, the Son of Man, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples and nations and languages should serve him. And his dominion is everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. And his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. That's pretty high standing. Okay? To have dominion means to have sovereignty or control. So the Son of Man is given sovereignty or control over all peoples, all nations, all languages. His dominion is everlasting, will never pass away, will not be destroyed. Okay? So that, I mean, that's pretty big stuff. This is not some prophet, right? Now, one of the five solas of the Reformation, and the five solas are, you know, uh, sola fide, by faith alone, sola Christus, by Christ alone, sola gratia, by uh, grace alone, uh, sola deo gloria, to God alone goes to glory, and sola scriptura. Those are the five solas of the Reformation, and, and they're to say that it, nothing else but them Okay, it's by faith alone and through grace alone and because of the finished work of Christ alone that you get saved and that to God alone goes the glory and that scripture alone is our final authority, not scripture in some man or scripture in some church. Okay, it's a, it's that. So the, one of the five solas there is soli deo gloria, meaning to God alone goes the glory. Glory belongs to no celestial being nor man other than God and God alone. This is absolutely clear in Scripture. But the Son of Man here is given glory because the Son of Man is God. This is another way that John's Gospel is telling you and that Jesus himself told you that he is God in human flesh. Okay? And then you're going to have people that tell you that Jesus never claimed to be God. <laughs> That's, I mean... Those are blind people that have no idea how to read scripture and because uh, he does on numerous occasions. And if you ever wonder if Jesus claims to be God, watch the Jews. Because when they start tearing their clothes or picking up stones to kill him, it's because they understood what he just said was a claim to deity. Okay? Now this section of scripture showed us four ways of coming to Jesus. Andrew came to Jesus through the preaching of John, John the Baptist, which showed people their need to repent and their need for a Savior. Powerful preaching can lead people to Jesus. We see it all the time, right? God will use somebody giving you the word to make you come to Jesus. Now, Peter came to Jesus because of the witness of his brother. When a trusted friend or relative has a life not live changing, life changing. Wow, well, Bill. A life changing uh, experience with Jesus and shares it. We call it a personal testimony. That person, how many people have been affected by someone's personal testimony and then wanted to know more about Jesus because of it? I don't think people convert because of a personal testimony, but it's what brings them to go look at what the uh, the actual thing is. Now, Philip came to Jesus as a result of a direct call of Jesus. Now, I wouldn't lay around waiting for Jesus to appear to you like he did to uh, either Philip or, or Paul. Um, Philip, he was in person, and Paul, he came in, in a vision. I wouldn't wait for that personal call. But 
if Jesus did that, people have come because Jesus came to him personally. But Nathaniel came to Jesus by a personal encounter with Jesus. And we can still have that personal encounter with Jesus today through God's word. We can know more about Jesus today than most people did in the early centuries of the uh, church age because scripture is readily available to us. Not only scripture, but study tools. You have so much information accessible to you. You can learn so much about Jesus that early Christians had no access to this stuff. Right? Our goal as Christians should be to introduce people to Jesus. But not all of us are street evangelists, right? Not all of us are comfortable going out and, and meeting people in the line at Walmart and saying, hey, have you heard about Jesus or whatever? You know, I mean, that's I know some people that do that, but that's not everybody's thing. Sometimes you show Jesus by how you live, how you treat other people, how you interact with what you're doing. You make them want to ask, hey, why are you acting this way? And that's why First Peter says, always be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within you, right? And you give that answer because you're trying to live the gospel. But we should all be, all be ready to do this, right? And don't be afraid. We don't all have the knowledge. Nobody starts all-knowing. No, I'm not all-knowing now. I don't even call myself a scholar. I read scholars. I read far more than the average Christian, and sadly, that's by my experience. I do more research than most people do, and I ask questions that I find a lot of people don't ask. So I have some gifts that were given by God that help me in what I do here, but I don't have all the answers. But if you come to me and you say, Bill, what about this? And I don't know the answer, I will try to find it or at least direct you to where somebody that has the answer. Okay. You don't need to be afraid that you don't have, oh, I'm going to put out something and they'll come back with a rebuttal. I don't know. Just admit, okay, I don't currently know the answer to the question you're asking. Give me some time. I'll go research it. I'll come back to you. Can we have an appointment next week or whatever? And then make a, make a return visit and you go out there because you're going to do that. But a lot of times, all we need to do is say, you know, come and see. And open up your Bible and, and show them where these things are in, in, the, in the Bible. Look and see. And I think that's what we learn from these callings. Right? We also have in here four different things the apostles testified about Jesus. John the Baptist testified that Jesus is, the, is eternal. And that he is man uniquely anointed by the Holy Spirit, and that he's the Lamb of God, and that Jesus is the unique Son of God. All those things came out of the mouth of John the Baptist, right? Andrew testified that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ. Philip testified that Jesus is the one prophesied in the Old Testament. And Nathaniel testified that Jesus is the Son of God and King of Israel. All of those things were testified in this chapter. And not only this chapter, this this ending of this chapter we had the high christology we started off with then we went into john the baptist's testimony now we had the testimony of a few of the apostles that are showing you what was going on in in with jesus here and and that's why i said is it's going to take a minute to go through the gospel of john it is thick with theological uh pronouncements and and ideas it is full of references to the Old Testament. What a surprise. And we will, uh, I'll get through it as time permits. But if you, give me a second. I'm going to put on a song and we'll, uh, what do you call it, read the chat and see if there's anything we uh, need to talk about from this discussion.
Praise the Lord, all you nations, sing His praises, all you peoples. Okay, so, yeah, the um, interesting questions, Mr. Snarf. Uh, there are prophecies in, in the Bible about how they're going to end, and John's life did end being led around. They had to carry him into church as a, on a stretcher. Uh, you have the prophesied death of Peter when you get later in the Gospel of John, and uh, that... We don't have solid evidence of the martyrdom of all of the apostles, except for John. We have it for a significant number of them and some less uh, solid evidence. Church tradition holds that they were all martyred for their faith. Okay, We don't have any contradictory evidence. There's no evidence around that of... Uh, somebody living into a, a late date in their in their life that wasn't martyred, so there's no reason to doubt that they were all martyred for their faith. But it's not as solid as people might want to say, and uh, so um, Papa Don, when you said the best response uh, when people try to debate me is simply reply, "All I know is what he has done in my life, and that can't be refuted." And that's a personal testimony like that can be true. Um, but I, I don't debate. I used to debate. I hate debate. The purpose of debating is to win. I want to have a conversation. The purpose in a conversation should be, I want to better understand your point and how you came to it, what you what supports your position. And I want you to listen to me explain my point of view and why I hold it. And for us to come to some kind of meetings in the mind, and we may never agree, but the purpose of the conversation is to share that information. And it's not, I, I don't care if to win or not win. It's not my job to get you into heaven. It's above my pay grade. That's the Holy Spirit will enlighten you or bring you into heaven. It, and through his power, I can't get a single person into heaven. I am free. All my job is to do is to share the truth of the gospel the best way I can. And then, like I said, often some of the, the people that I know that are, I would consider the holiest. And I you'll hear me praise my wife all the time. She's an amazing person, best person I've ever met in my life. Okay. And Jesus, she doesn't go around praising and showing her Christianity to you all the time. She does talk about Jesus regularly and thank Jesus for anything. But most of the time, you see Jesus through the way she lives. That's what I wanted. That's what I ultimately hope to have happen as well. I want them to see Jesus in me and say, what is it that makes you be like this? And give me a chance to explain. Because I was the rough, aggressive you know, combat Christian, and I'm going to wrestle you into the heaven. I've been there, done that. It, it doesn't work. It's not good for me. And, uh, you know, it's it's a phase a lot of people go through, and some people never get out of. But I think if we learn to just show Jesus, show the love of Jesus, that's an attractive uh, point for people to come to and to come back to. And, um, you know, Sometimes I'm just hoping to get my own self out of the way of what the Holy Spirit's trying to say and not let my own mouth get me in trouble. Because I have the temper, I have the mouth, I can alienate people and, and do that, and that's not my goal. My goal is to just uh, calmly present the, the truth as I know it. And I think... I've gotten better at it as I got older. Maybe you just get calm. Maybe I'm tired. I don't know. But it's, I feel like it's getting better. I'm not as aggressive in, in doing it. But that wasn't always the case. And I thought I was doing God's work before. We all grow. We all mature. We all are on, on our own path. God's leading us. And you're not to be a cookie cutter of Bill. And I'm not going to ever be a cookie cutter of you. Right? 
we we come out and we're following Jesus to the best we can. And that's what these apostles, you're going to see, they're all different. They have different personalities. You don't get called the sons of thunder because you're calm, right? I mean, those are those are definitely uh, high energy people to get that name nickname from Jesus. Thomas, we call him Doubting Thomas because he's very analytical. I identify with Thomas a lot. And then, you know, thanks to the uh, movie The Chosen, I'll never see Matthew other than as, as somebody who has autism, right, you know? And it, and it drives me crazy in The Chosen. I really didn't appreciate it, but it it's now stuck in my head. I don't think Matthew ever really had autism, but in, in The Chosen, they put it in there, and it's, it's now forever in my mind. So uh, we all grow. We all do that stuff. Don't forget, Michael's coming on at 1 o'clock uh, Pacific time in four minutes and with bended knee. Uh, and I'm, so I'm going to uh, put on my exit. And God willing, I will see you on Friday. And we'll start our series on uh, popular myths. And I'll probably start with things like the Da Vinci Code and, and the other book, Holy Blood, Holy Grail. You know? And... Uh, God bless you all, and I'll see you then.